Okay, so welcome everybody. We're delighted that you can join us this morning for our Forest Education Network England webinar, Creating Forest and Woodlands with Children and Young People. And we're delighted, especially today, to have Pippa and Anna, who are going to speak to us from the Children's Forest and the exciting work that they've already started. And we're really thrilled as well to have Megan and Beth who have come from Earthwatch and they're going to be sharing tiny forests and each of them will get a, a little bit bigger of a, um, a, an introduction from me when we get to them. Forest Education Network England, if I can just briefly share with you, it's been a, a very organic process um, and, and people on this call have been involved with that uh, through many, many years in its different guises. Um, we now are an organisation or a, almost like a mycelium. Oh, there's a lovely dog. Is that yours? I wonder if you could put yourself on mute. I don't know whose dog it is. It's always good to have authentic sounds in the background, isn't it? Um, but we are next and we don't we don't have a, a charitable status or anything like that we're just a group, whole group of people who are in different organizations wanting to further and promote children young people and education being involved in forestry so it's a really broad range of organizations that are involved so if your organization isn't sort of officially connected up and you want to be just um just tell us and we'd love you to we'd love you to join in so I think this is the time to say that we have had a momentous week in terms of uh, government and policy. We've had the England Tree Action Plan has actually been launched this week along with the Peace Action Plan. The thing that was very noticeable for, for those of us in Fen was that education has not featured. And although we are disappointed, um, the reasoning given was that education had already had funding through the 25 Year Action Plan. Uh, um, and that works so the children um, the what's it called nature friendly schools has had funding and we've got the community forest and woodland outreach project has funding and the care farming was funded through the government but so that's exciting that those projects are still working and they are still going but the government feeling at the moment is education has already had enough of the funding pot we are here as, as all our groups to kind of say education is part of what needs to be here in terms of climate change and climate biodiversity and also the well-being and the um, of children and young people particularly post-covid is vitally important so it's a fabulous thing that we're gathering this morning and going to be really sharing the impact of the projects that we're going to hear about Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Pippa and Anna from the Children's Forest. Their work is really thrilling. I, I think you all agree. And they're very much looking for people who want to get connected and involved with them. So we're going to hand over to them. Technologically, we may be challenged. Um, we, have at, we have all sorts of plans up our sleeve if we get cut off. Uh, um, and we will record the presentations and make sure they get to everybody. Pippa and Anna, thank you so much and over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everybody. It's really lovely to be here. And uh, Anna and I um, have made a presentation which we're going to show you. And uh, just to let you know that we have neither of us ever done a webinar on Zoom before. <laughs> so this is a, a learning curve for us and hopefully all will go smoothly. So. Let's see if we can start. <laughs> okay. Hey. Hey. Great. <laughs> so, um, welcome to the Children's Forest presentation. Um, and I'm Anna, and um, just for a bit of background, I've been doing forest school work and nature mentoring with young people from toddlers to teens. Um, for many years and the Children's Forest Project really has grown out of that work with the children and um, so the vision of the project is for for children to be enabled to 
plant, um, well, to imagine, plant and then tend forests for the future generations. So really the name Children's Forest also is about us looking after the children of all the species. It's not just for the children of the human beings. So, and for that to be part of the um, intention and education for the children in the project. Um, it really came out of the work of, as I was saying, working with the children in forest school and really noticing their need um, for reciprocity, I feel, for children to have um, an involvement, a direct involvement in, in working with the land and helping support the trees and animals and, you know, um, the environment that we are enjoying in our forest school time. So forest school really offers that connection and that expression of, yeah, direct connection with nature. Um, but it really, yeah, really felt like over time, the woodlands we were working in were getting depleted and resources were getting used and that's, that's fine. So, it, but it needs that extra balance. Um, so another aspect of the project was really noticing that a lot of the time accessibility to land for forest schools has been a bit of an issue over the years. So um, the children's forest really is about approaching um, landowners and um, council land, all different kinds of um, situations. We're looking at hospital um, grounds at the moment as well and a children's hospital. Lots of different possible land that children can be welcome to plant their forests as well. So it it enables this bridge between the children and um, accessibility to land. Um, yeah, obviously we all know that planting trees is so important for the climate and climate change and children are really acutely aware of that so this is all also about really offering the children a sense of positive action that they can be involved in to to help the environment and we feel like as well as being practically really important that's really important for the mental health and well-being of young people coming in you know into this time where they're inheriting a world that they are learning about is under threat so we feel it's actually our responsibility to to really give positive um positive hope for the future through direct action um sorry i'm just checking my notes as well yeah one of the other aspects which is really fundamental and you'll see in the talk we'll talk more about this is about helping on that note to really help young people especially children to have um a sense that human beings as a species in the family of life on planet earth can be restorers caretakers guardians of the natural world we can have a very positive um, role to play within as part of the biodiversity in our planet so that is a very essential key part of the vision as well to help educate that for children help them feel that they're participating um, as a positive species so i think yeah that probably next step so as part of that children's forest has identified we could say like four main steps on the journey of what it is that we are calling a children's forest. Um, so as you can see here, the forest experience and then envisioning, uh, which is future ge generational thinking, <clears throat> planting the trees themselves, and then the tending of that, um, that woodland in years to come. So, so that's the overall Four step journey and we'll talk more about that in detail so, so step one for it so this step one um so many of us all of us probably on this call are very familiar with forests and have spent time in forests and and so if we think about a forest we can really imagine it it's already there in our in our experience and there's a lot of children in in the world who do not have that experience so far so really to plant a forest we feel like it's very important for the children to understand what they are actually planting to go and spend time in the forest to grow to feel connected with trees 
to feel connected with the life that trees support or the animals, the biodiversity, to have the experience of feeling that they belong in the forest, they can spend time around the fire. It's a place that they love, treasure, and really that brings them a sense of aliveness. Um, it is important for that to be given to children, especially in urban environments. So yeah, we, that's a requirement for children's forests that we want to encourage that connection for the children to forest environment prior to planting. Yeah. And then, so um, another part of the vision for the project really is to we call it activate future generational thinking sounds a bit like a mouthful there but really all the indigenous people who managed to live sustainably for thousands of years we we can identify certain ways of um, thinking and approaching their partic participation in the natural world one of them being that with all the actions that are carried out there's consideration for the future generations and clearly one of the um, aspects really lacking in our education or Western paradigm, if you could say, is that we've, we've really stopped being able to kind of consider, cons constantly consider how, we, how will what we're doing now impact on the future generation. So um, we're identifying here that, you know, the power of the imagination comes before all action. So, you know, we do this as a human being, we have this innate capacity, we imagine something and then we do it. And we do it all the time. I know as a forest school, um, you know, I have to plan my session, I have to envision what I'm going to do. I have to imagine, you know, I, I, I might know what the weather's gonna be like. So then I, I envision the whole day and take along crafts and activities that I feel will, um, you know, be appropriate for that. So I've envisioned the whole thing before I get there and then it unfolds with flow and we let things go and bring new things in. But so really we want to help the children have this um, understanding that their imagination is really important and that we imagine a positive future and a healthy world will be what helps us create that. So long-winded way of saying so we'll go to the site where we're going to plant let's say we've got an empty field and then we do creative activities with the children visualizations um, art activities poetry stories all different ways of um, helping the children get like excited inside themselves about the forest that will become there in that field so they're starting to imagine it in 200 years time and um, yes, they're going to imagine perhaps working forward a bit, bringing their children there and how tall would the trees be when they come back with their children? How tall would the trees be when they come back with their grandchildren? Will they be able to harvest the hazelnuts from them? And, you know, all of those kind of aspects. So here in this picture anyway, you can see the children getting involved um, with one of the children's forests we planted with painting their vision of the healthy forest. Um, and yeah, they painted beautiful trees and then we hang it all up together as one big forest on a, on a line in the forest and did a um, visualisation there. So that's the step two. Yeah. Ah, so, ah, yes. Yeah, so we're just going to invite you just for a moment to have a little taster of um, just very, very simply something we might do with the children around this envisioning. So you could just for a moment... Um, Close your eyes and just take a nice deep breath and just imagine or remember, we could say, remember a forest that you have been to or that you love going to, a place that's really special to you, a beautiful forest. And just perhaps, perhaps you've been recently and you can imagine there the bluebells and the smell of the bluebells and Maybe you can see the oak trees around you and the birch, hazel, beech, pine. I'm not sure what, forest, what trees you have in this forest, but just feel them around you. And hearing the bird song in the treetops and smelling the smells of the forest. And perhaps you can feel the breeze 
gentle breeze coming through, sunlight in the dappled leaves. Moss, the ferns. And just notice how your body feels in, in when you when you're imagining this for us, just notice how your body's responding and yeah, perhaps you feel a nice sense of relaxation in this golden green light of the forest. And then just imagine now, just take a deep breath and imagine a, a, um, a new scene appearing before you. And this is um, a big open expanse. Perhaps it's a field or, um, yeah, maybe just imagine a, a field, an empty field. And we're going to just fast forward in time now and imagine you're with a group of people planting this field up with all different trees that you know and love, the hazel and the oak and the birch and all these different trees. And imagine now that you're fast forwarding in time, if you like, and watching that growing and growing and growing. Imagine until you can see that you're now standing in a forest that has the height of the canopy of, of the trees that you were imagining in the forest you already know. Imagine this forest that's been planted and the water, the streams in the forest that are flowing with clean water and the fresh air blowing through the leaves. And it's full of life and perhaps you can imagine some of the forest animals, the, the deer, the foxes. And take a deep breath in of that beautiful forest scene. And just, yeah, you can open your eyes. Yeah, and just feel into, yeah, that possibility, that joyous feeling of what it would be like to help actually participate in um, enabling that golden green forest to, to grow into the future beyond your own lifetime. So, yeah, so with the children, what we might do at that point is we actually ask them to open their eyes and then ask them they could turn into their favourite animal and then run through that field where we're going to plant, imagining it as an ancient forest in a few hundred years time. So <laughs> you can get a little flavour of <laughs> what we're doing there. Okay. Okay, so when we... Um, when we've got a site for our growing this beautiful golden green forest that we've just all imagined in that visualization, the very first thing that we do on that site is we create a space for the children's fire. And this is just literally a fire circle that, that ideally we put um, central to the trees that we're going to plant. And it forms the, um, the central focus point for the children's forest planting. And it's a place that we sit round with the children. We might do the visualization exercise there. We might share some gratitude, um, but it's a, it's a really important um, aspect of the children's forest because the idea with it is that it not only provides a place that, that we can come back to each time we come to visit the trees and gather, um, but it also is um, rekindling in our, in our beings, in our memory, um, the idea that every decision we make, we need to be thinking about the children and the children of the future and the children of all species into the future. So this is an idea that we bring to the fire and we say to the children each time that we gather there. So we light the fire and we remember that what we're doing is planting these trees for our children and our grandchildren and imagining into the future. So again, it's another way that we bring in that, that kind of positive future visioning for the children and the adults who are working with them in that group. So um, that's our kind of, our kind of centerpiece of our, uh, any um, uh, children's forest that we create. 
Um, and then another important thing that we do before we plant trees is um, after we've done these kind of visualizations and the imagining and the forest experience that Anna's described, we um, get the children each to write or draw if they prefer or they can't write yet, their wishes for the future generations. And um, we use these lovely um, pieces of birch bark. I mean, you can obviously use pieces of paper as well, but it's, it gives it a kind of uh, a sense of ceremony that the children are writing their wishes on a piece of birch bark and they can write whatever they choose that's their wish in their heart for the future generations and for the forest that they're going to plant. Um, and the scrolls then all get rolled up and, and tied together and popped in a basket and we use them um, later. Oh yeah, another thing that we do at that stage is we, um, we get the children to sit in a circle around the children's fire and they share, if they want to, they share what's written on their, um, on their little scrolls, so they share their wishes. Um, and that can be a really beautiful and powerful thing to um, really um, activate that positive idea of what, the, what they're going to be creating or helping to create with the children's forest. <laughs> um, so now we're sort of moving closer and closer to the actual planting of the of the forest with the children but before we get to the stage of actually putting the trees in the ground we just have this other stage which is somewhere between design and and imagining um, where we get the children to really embody what the forest is going to become so here in this circle you can see a group of school children and they have been thinking about the oak tree and looking at the oak tree sapling that they're going to plant and then now they're thinking about what that tree might look like in a hundred years time. How much space will the canopy of that tree take um, in this, this field, which is gonna be a woodland. So actually physically joining hands in a circle and being that great big oak tree that, um, that they might bring their grandchildren back to visit. Um, and another thing that we do here then is we start to build in the idea of the ecosystem of the forest by getting the children to play the different parts of a forest. So some of them might be the big oak trees standing, being as big as they can be. And then some of them might be the elder and the hazel. So kind of tucked a little bit underneath the canopy. And then we get the children to name some of the other plants that we are envisaging will come to the forest. So they might choose to be the bluebells or the wood anemones or the bramble or the bracken. And they actually physically be those things. And then the favorite activity of course is being the animals and birds that are gonna to come to the forest. So we have, you know, the foxes and the sparrow hawks and the badgers and the children all snuffling around and <laughs> or running around or being snakes and sliding around. But between the group, they kind of, they kind of um, physically embody the ecosystem that we're hoping to create in this space. Um, and what it does, partly what it does, apart from being a lot of fun and um, you know, giving them something really memorable, it also then leads us into talking about how we're gonna plant the trees and the fact that, that this stage of planting is the stage at which we can have the biggest impact, that we can be the biggest helpers to these trees if we do a really good job. So the emphasis is not so much on planting numbers, but on planting really well and in a really connected way. So the first thing we do then is we move from these big embodied games into the places where we're going to plant the trees. And first of all, we work usually with the youngest child in the group and one of the facilitators will plant the first tree with that child um, while demonstrating to the rest of the group a really, really good mindful way of planting the trees. So we dig a hole and we put in a stake if that's going to be necessary. And then the children put their wish that they've made earlier on the little scroll into the hole where the tree is going to go. And we emphasize to the children that this is a wish for the whole forest, because obviously not all the trees will necessarily make it. Um, so the wish is for the forest, but the children get to pop it in the hole that they're going to put their first tree in. 
Um, and then we bring in some um, leaf litter from the nearby forest floor and we, they put a little bit of a sprinkling in that of that in which gives us the opportunity to talk about the mycelium and all the fungi and the microorganisms that are going to support these trees becoming a really diverse ecosystem and a really beautiful forest. And then we plant the tree and we fill around the tree being careful that the children understand about the levels and you know getting the bottom of the um, uh, the trunk in the right place so the tree will thrive and won't struggle. And then if we're going to use tree guards or um, deer guards, then we show the children how to put those on in a really good way. And then how to water their trees so that it's, it's really nice and settled in the earth and then mulch their trees. And um, on the last project that, that we that we did, we were able to get some local sheep's wool for the children to mulch their trees with. So they were able to really kind of snuggle their trees in with this lovely sheep's wool and tend them. And it was a, it was a real kind of caring, nurturing activity that they were able to do. And then um, the children go off and they all plant um, their first tree. And uh, oh, before this stage, I should say that the children have got the opportunity to choose their tree. So that's a really nice piece that they can, we've, we've got all, uh, all the, um, the little saplings and the children can come and they know the trees because of the activities that they've done in the, the forest experience. So they, you know, they know something about the, the different kinds of wood and the fruit or what these trees might look like. And they can come and choose the tree that they feel that they'd really like to put in the ground and that's their first tree that they plant and then we spend the rest of the day planting as many trees as we we can in our children's forest um oh i don't know i haven't got a picture and then at the end of this process we always have a little celebration as well to really acknowledge that the the work that the children have put in and the focus that they've had and to bless the trees with a poem or a song or some music so that it really becomes a, a very um, positive and celebratory thing, the creation of this children's forest, the beginnings of it. So, and um, so going to be slightly speedier. <laughs> um, so the, the step four is really, we could say like, up to step three, the birth of that forest, the planting of that forest is, is really the beginning then of an ongoing relationship that the children, so children's forest is set up to welcome the children back to those places that they planted again and again over the coming years and hopefully their life. So, um, for example, one of the places we have planted this spring, we've now started the um, process of, of um, yeah, creating some insect homes, um, nest nests for mice and bird boxes and woven bird houses that we're going to return to the woods with next week to the trees we've planted and we'll put those things in the surrounding area. So it's about inviting, yeah, inviting um, the ongoing relationships with the trees, but also the animals. So um, we're thinking about really wanting that place to be a place for the birds and bats and insects and so on. So um, ongoingly, we absolutely are imagining into um, this, um, the ongoing tending of the children's forests will involve um, an ecologist that might come in and do um, surveys with the children. So it's an opportunity really for the children to feel a sense of guardianship for that place that they planted. They'll be planting more trees hopefully each year as well so they get to see those that that forest grow. Um, yeah and we can imagine in like community days where they might come back with their parents, their grandparents, their brothers and sisters. Um, so yeah it's a place that they return to and they might need to do some clearing, they might need to do some watering, mulching, you know deer guards will be removed as the years go on. So just getting that that um, view of them, yeah, caretaking the forest over the coming years that they have planted. Yeah. So we've put in our little uh, film that was made um, of one of the plantings that we did. Um, so we're, we're going to try and play it, but if it doesn't play, um, for you on Zoom, then in the chat, at the top of the chat is the link 
to the YouTube. So it could be that it will be easier for you to just quickly flick on that link and watch it on YouTube and then come back to us. But we'll play it through on here and come back together at the end, which is in two and a half minutes. Okay? okay. <laughs> Imagine a future where life can thrive, where forests ring to the sound of birds, where the air and water are... Hello, sorry, I think Pippa, I think you're muted, so you've muted the video. Children develop genuine care and personal relationship with the natural world. Children develop genuine care and personal relationship with the natural world. Their time in the woods enables the children to look out over the land and imagine the future forests. Through the creative arts, they engage with the vision of the woodland that they will plant. As they plant the trees, the children plant their wishes for the future generations. The native trees are carefully chosen to best suit the land and where possible have been grown from local seed by the children themselves. We plant our woodland around a central children's fire. There, the children will continue to gather in years to come to tend the forest, supported by their families and communities. I'm really lucky as a landowner to have an opportunity to care and to give something back and also to give to the future. It's so much more than just planting trees, having this whole educational element where the children are really understanding the importance of tending and maintaining and being in relationship with the woodland is, is just such a wider vision for bringing this land back into balance. We would love to see children's forests spreading far and wide. If you are inspired by our vision, Please plant one with us. Hey, can't move off the screen. I do. In a minute. I just... Can you still hear me talking? Sarah, can you hear? Yes, yes, thank you. We can hear you. Okay. I right. can't move the slot. Hang on, I'm just going to I think that do that. Maybe shall I just talk to a few things while you're doing that? Mm. Oh, okay, we've got it. I'm just going to do it like that. Okay. And then I can't see Zoom. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now, everyone on this call knows that we should all be in the woods together. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> all, are really feeling, all are feeling your pain, and I'm sure that nobody here is going to mind at all. <laughs> okay, I think we're back on. Is that good? Can Thank you, see you. That? It looks wonderful. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, uh, I just admit now that we didn't know how long this would take, and it's probably a little bit taking a bit longer than we thought. So, we'll go through the last um, few slides as quickly as possible. So, Forest from Seed is um, a kind of it kind of started as a bit of a side project to the children's forest, and we thought it would be really lovely for the children to. Um, collect seed and grow it themselves and you know see that whole part of the of the cycle of life of their woodland um, and as we've developed the pilot project over this last year it's it's really become a very very important thing and something that we feel is actually a really central part of the children's forest so um, 
uh, it's sort of self-explanatory, but basically um, the idea is to work with the children through the autumn and the winter to collect the seed as it ripens on the trees in the forests, um, and then to grow those um, seeds um, into baby trees, which we then can plant in the children's forest the following uh, winter. So that can be a very simple thing of just, you know, collecting an acorn and popping it in a pot. And um, as all of you, I'm sure, will know, acorns are just desperate to grow and um, you're likely to have a lot of success and, and a lot of baby oak trees. Um, but we've also been um, experimenting with growing lots of other trees in the last year and um, I've set up a small children's nursery um, where just last week we, we spent time with the children um, who brought their tiny seeds that they've had overwintering at home and popped them in the into the ground and it was such a very powerful and beautiful thing and it really um, felt like a very uh, very important kind of process for the children to be understanding and learning about and the intention is then that these seeds will then be um, put into the children's forest plantings um, in the coming autumn. Um, so we've been doing this as a pilot project this year and our intention is to offer training and um, make some films and so on about it so that anybody who wants to run a children's forest project can also set up um, a forest from seed project and, and grow some of the trees for their children's forest from seed. Um, so yes, I feel like I should have said this at the beginning, but this this project is very much partnered and aligned with the forest school movement. So um, we really it goes hand in hand really with the education of children out in the woods and then the extension of that education in the woods being the creation of the woods and um, mean here the pedagogy meaning this is something we're developing is um, and this is something which really you know we know worldwide really needs to be developed as well on what kind of level one approaches climate change and tree planting environmental um, matters such as this with what age groups and how to do that so um, very very broadly speaking what you're, when you're working with very young children it's all in the magical realms I mean very much you can just say you know we um, trees give us so much life and we want to give back to the trees and we make fairy homes so that the fairies can live in the trees it's that kind of magical level really and then when you're working up more with the primary school level we're we're looking into ways of how do we really engage the creativity and um um direct kind of um yeah creativity writing artwork um making of things to help engage the children directly with with the environment to help it be a very connected experience for them with the tree planting and then we'd move up into teen age years and you're looking much more at being able to go in there at a more scientific level of how trees in, in um are beneficial for the environment, the soil, the water, how, you know, their life cycle of trees, forests, why we need them for the balance of life on earth and why it's therefore so positive and important to be planting them in a good way and planting the right species in the right places, all of those kind of levels. So, so yeah, really interested in developing, um, yeah, an understanding of the pedagogical approach that will help this to be the most connective it can be and the yeah the most meaningful for the children so yeah and um, moving on to that um, mental health and well-being we know very much um, all of us know the importance of um, especially for young adults actually there's a, a, a huge amount of like, anxiety depression um, you know suicidal tendencies at this time that's due to um, eco anxiety covid all the rest of the imbalances that our, our, our world is going through at the moment um, and one of the people who's just come on to the children's forest team is a psychologist so we're working with her 
um, very much to look at how um, how children's forests can be or like how planting not it's not just children's forests but how connection to nature and um, positive action and getting involved in eco restoration is incredibly important for mental health and well-being so we're looking at with children's forest at the moment of starting to get to develop a youth program for 16 to kind of 24 year olds so so that these young people can be trained in basic forest school can be um, mentored in how to plant the forest with the children and then can become basically um, employed if you like as young children's forest mentors so we want that every children's forest program planting can involve young people teenagers and young adults helping the younger children with the planting and we feel like that's a really important role of responsibility for the young adults. So, yeah. So um, this was our breakout room question, which we don't have time to go into breakout rooms for, but um, we offer it to you all as a question um, to take away from the presentation. Um, and if you feel, um, and you've got you've got capacity to respond to it we would really love to hear people's feedback about this and it would really genuinely um support the children's forest project and feed into how we develop the project to know what it is that you feel as people involved with children and woodlands is really needed at this time um to support and educate our children to have a healthy relationship with the li living world um so if that's something that resonates for you and you feel to respond to, then please do. And that's our email address, connect at childrenforest.org. And we would love to, um, to hear from you sometime after this webinar. Um, so just to wrap up, um, one of the next steps that we're taking with the Children's Forest is to offer two trainings at the end of this year for people who already work with children in woodlands um, and who are inspired by the children's forest vision and think that they might like to take that forward as a project to do with the children that they work with. So the two trainings cover the four stages of the children's forest process. So step one and two, the forest experience and envisioning and step three and four, the planning, planting and tending. And those are both going to be held in the autumn uh, in Sussex and again if you're interested in that it would be great to hear from you and you can email us on the connect at children's forest address um, and we can let you know more details about those. So we'd like to just um, finish off I'd love to read you this poem and just before I read it out to you um, just to so you understand how this poem came about um we were we were gonna we were prepping to plant um a children's forest in this field um sent the children off these are children aged kind of nine ten years old they'd gone off to sit in the for in the field and imagine the forest as it might be in 100 or 200 years time and then they were um, instructed to come back and whisper to me in my ear their line for the poem so none of them knew what anyone else was writing and this was the exact order it hasn't been changed of how how each of them came and whispered their line back so this is one class doing their imagination so you could just have a listen to this as the forest around me buzzes with life, a stream trickles through the valley. Water now flows where none flowed before. Thrushes flit among the trees and all the trees are waking from a deep, deep sleep. I see the world in a different way. Mossy streams gurgle and bubble with foam. Robin sings. An old oak gives animals a home. Here, foxes live in the roots. Deer roam freely. When winter falls, there's snowballs. Trees talk silently. Rushes by the brookside cover the banks in green. The trees are swaying in the wind. Somewhere in the forest, there is a group of trees where there is a little beehive with lots of little bees. Fresh green moss covers the floor. And in the old oak tree, there is a secret door. 
Trees with dear moss and lichen shine green shades, and the breeze through the leaves is pure like sunlight. So that was a final word from the children. So thank you all very much for bearing with us. Sorry, it's probably slightly longer than we had imagined. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to have questions question time I don't think so um thank but you we... so much Pippa I think we can sneak in a question <laughs> we do we do thank have some you very much Pippa Anna. Sarah you can do yeah, lovely. It was lovely, Anna and Pippa, and so lovely to hear so much about your project things. We have got some really lovely questions, so what I will do is um, collate them and send them to you afterwards, and then we can um, send the responses around to everybody um, and things. But yeah, really nice. I suppose um, if I if I start um, with one of them was um, a question was asked about where Children's Forest was based, and I think you've asked that it's sort of nationwide, but I suppose could you tell us, is it like a known product for you if anybody else had wanted to set one up or can they approach you? How does it work? Um, so we're based in Sussex, like most of the team um, are in Sussex at the moment, but um, yeah we've got yeah Sarah and John and yeah no there are people around the country who are part of the team, um, the larger team. Um, what we what we're working towards at the moment it's not like we want to own children's forest as a thing as a brand or something like that um but we would love to to hold the integrity of the vision of the project i guess to make sure that all of those stages are um are in place so that it really can be the most connected for the children so in that regard we're looking at um, you know, how can we ensure that the forest is going to be looked after after the event of planting? How can we be, be ensured that there'll be a facilitator who can help take the children back to the forest and be committed to that work? So there's certain fundamental relationships that we'd really like to encourage to be in place. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's directly answering that I guess question. the ideal thing, if you feel like it's something that you'd really love to do, is to come on the trainings in the autumn where you can really learn more and feel more into the whole, the process and the ethos. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and also if you know, um, if you are a facilitator or you know a landowner who would be interested in this project, or you work in a school and, you know, if you have children, um, please get in touch and we'll definitely do everything we can to help um, you initiate a children's forest in your area. So it's not a prerequisite to, for you to need to come on the training to plant a children's forest, um, but we would love to work with you to help that to, to yeah, come into the world. So yeah, oh, yeah. please, yeah, get in touch. Does that answer that question? Yes, so that's lovely, that's great. And as I say, I'll collate all the others and then um, we'll, we'll write some answers up and then um, pop those with the recording when we share it. Um, so I'll hand back to you, Sarah. So ready for a little break before? Thanks. Week. Thanks, Sarah. And there have been some, some great questions, which we'll, we'll make sure that we uh, chat with Anna and Pippa and find out their thoughts. And we will share them, as you said. So we'd like to invite you to have a, a five minute break now to go and have a comfort break um, and return. We're going to start with our next presentation at 12 o'clock. So if you'd like to stay stay and um, just enjoy being in the room where you're sitting, feel free. If you'd like to go for a little wander outside and grab a drink, but we'll be back here at 12 o'clock for our next presentation. Thank you so much, Pippa and Anna. Um, yes. I think there are lots of people who are gonna love when they listen to the recording, are gonna be very excited by what you've shared. So thank you so much. So we'd like to see you back here at 12 o'clock and we're going to hear from Megan and Beth as they share what tiny forests have been doing. So thank you everybody. See you in seven minutes. We've got everyone back in the room with us and I'm delighted that we're going to be able to hand over to Megan and um, and Beth from Earthwatch. So Megan comes as an 
from the education team at Earthwatch working on tiny forests. And we've got Beth who is joining us from the research side of the team. So we're gonna look forward to hearing from them and uh, something funny at the moment is happening with technology here, Sarah. I've got you looking lovely, but <laughs> with your very great Forestry England uh, sweatshirt <laughs> on, I think that's super. But Megan, I wonder if there's a way of making sure that we now get you on the screen. I am here, um, but uh, we're going to be sharing our screen anyway, so. Wonderful. Fine, I think. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, Megan, thank you so much. Thank you to you and Beth for joining us. I think people are going to really enjoy hearing from you. I know when you've come and talked to my forest school trainees that they've learned so much about the science of trees and uh, we've got lots to look forward to this morning. Thank you very much. Over to you both. Great. Well, thank you for having us. Um, yeah, really loved the Children's Forest first session. So hopefully we can live up to the standard that they set. Um, we are from Earthwatch, an environmental charity. Um, what we do is a combination of scientific research and engagement. So it's a kind of blended approach um, through what we call citizen science, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, but it's designing research projects that maybe Beth and her team, if they were to try and collect the data all by themselves, they'd be running around the country um, nonstop. So it's designed in a simple, accessible way so that anybody can get involved. Um, we work with lots of different people. So we work with kind of educators like yourselves or industry experts. Um, we work with businesses, corporates, schools, um, communities, pretty much everybody um, with our various projects. So I'm going to share my screen with you. OK, so today we're going to be talking a bit about our tiny forest project. Um, and going into a bit more detail about kind of the background of the project, why it, we kind of feel it's needed. Um, Beth's going to be sharing all the interesting stuff about the kind of scientific process of the tiny forests um, and how they came to be. Um, we'll have a little break for questions, hopefully, around then. So, um, and then we'll go into a bit more of the learning content um, about kind of how we engage with young people, schools, educators, and such like that. Um, thank you, Meg. So I think this is me. Um, <laughs> so tiny forests are an example of a nature-based solution. So nature-based solutions or interventions um, are things that are inspired by um, nature and involve working with nature to address societal challenges and providing benefits for both human well-being and also biodiversity. So specifically these are actions that involve the protection, restoration or management of natural and semi-natural ecosystems um, or the creation of novel ecosystems in and around cities in particular. So these are actions that are underpinned by naturally driven services and biodiversity and they're often designed and implemented with the engagement of local communities. So with Tiny Forest there's kind of three driving factors that kind of um, underpin why we've chosen this kind of nature-based intervention. Um, climate change of course being one major one. Um, we don't need to go into detail of the impacts of climate on the planet. I'm sure you're all well aware of what is happening. Um, but um, it is something that it's no longer kind of, there's no longer just space to kind of um, slow down the impacts. We start need to start making these active positive changes to mitigate the impacts as well. Um, and also the fact that the impacts of climate change are going currently and increasingly going to be distributed um, where disadvantaged communities will increasingly feel the impacts of the changes um, and that's partly where tiny forests being in an urban setting um, being placed in deprived communities um, or areas experiencing multiple levels of deprivation is trying to be 
addressed. Urbanisation, another one. We are seeing our cities getting busier and busier, um, although maybe that will change with more remote working in a post-COVID world. We'll soon see. Um, but with kind of global populations um, going to be 68% um, will be living in urban areas by 2050. It's something that we really need to address in terms of development. So where these new cities or urban areas are being built or growing, what can we put in place to kind of try and um, uh, decrease some of the impacts, the negative impacts to the local environment. So how can we regulate the temperature um, in the cities rather than allow this what's called urban heat island effect to keep increasing? Um, how do we um, address the fact that cities are at, at increased risk of flooding um, because of the impermeable um, kind of infrastructure? Um, there's kind of water resources um, in relation to kind of contamination of water. Um, in urban areas. And then of course, biodiversity, um, by building increasingly, we are just taking away habitats or fragmenting habitats as well. Um, so another area that we would are looking to address. And then another, which is of course, um, something that you'll all be aware of is the connection to nature, which we feel desperately needs to be um, kind of addressed. It's one of our main areas that we are really passionate about. But um, with fewer in, than one in 10 children actually playing in wild areas anymore, um, compared to one in five, uh, no, sorry, five in 10, just um, a generation ago. So, I mean, personally, I grew up, I think I spent most of my time outdoors. Um, like the Children's Forest team were saying earlier, it's something that some of the children we work with, even with the visualization exercise, they wouldn't quite know what to visualize potentially to start with because they just haven't had a chance to experience it. Um, and also children's radius of activity is also uh, declined by 90% in a single generation. So where we might have gone exploring further afield into the forest, um, children now are less likely to do that. So creating green, green spaces local to them is also really important. Um, and we want to build this connection to nature so that the children feel um, that they can, uh, are empowered to act positively for the planet in the future, not just for trees and forests, but more widely as well. Um, so obviously, yeah, there's, <laughs> a uh, big problem, lots of challenges to try and tackle. And obviously, whilst um, nature-based solutions and things like tiny forests obviously aren't the sole answer, there's lots of other things that need to be considered. It's a piece of the puzzle in changing kind of how we design and live in cities um, and changing people's perspectives or encouraging them to change their behaviors as well. Um, so now I'll have a little bit of an explore about how tiny forests came to be as they are today. So um, kind of go through the history of the evolution of tiny forests. So um, tiny forests are based on a concept called Miyawaki forest. So this is a methodology for planting forests in a particular way. And these actually um, kind of began, this methodology began in the 1970s um, and was created by a Japanese botanist called Professor Miyawaki. Um, so he studied during his early career in Germany um, where he was introduced to the concept of potential natural vegetation. And so this is the idea that um, had there been no human influence in an area, what vegetation would be present? And so when he returned to Japan, he found that he could find very few examples of vegetation undisturbed by human intervention. And it's something like only 0.3% of vegetation in Japan had never been influenced by human activity. And so the one place where he did find examples of um, more pristine vegetation and in particular pristine forest was in sacred shrine forests. So they called them Chinyu no Mori. I might have really 
butchered that <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> um, so apologies if anybody knows better how to pronounce it. Um, but these are sacred shrine forests that surround temples. So um, commonly in Japan, every shrine used to be surrounded by one of these forests and so the vegetation found here um, would have been protected and it's thought that it has existed since ancient times and so this offers a really good insight into what the natural state of the vegetation in that area used to be like and so Miyawaki used these ancient shrine forests as his reference and tried to um, restore ecologically sound native forests across Japan and importantly his um, one of his reasons for doing this was for them to function as disaster prevention and environmental preservation forests so obviously Japan has to deal with a lot of um, environmental disasters so things like tsunamis and earthquakes and so his thinking was these forests can help mitigate some of the impacts um, of these disasters, particularly in urban areas. Um, next slide, thank you. So usually um, in temperate forest regions, the establishment of um, a forest takes several hundred years. So the Miyawaki method um, is a concept that's trying to skip over some of the natural forest succession steps. So kind of ecologically engineering a older growth forest in a reduced time frame. Um, and we'll come back to this later on about how, how this works. Um, but Miyawaki himself um, and his research team has instructed people in planting in over 1,700 areas around the world, including lots of sites in Japan, in Borneo, and also in South America um, and China. So this, um, this was all back in the 70s and subsequently since then. Um, more recently, um, the Miyawaki method has been um, kind of reinvigorated. So in the early 2010s, Miyawaki collaborated with a guy in India called Shubendu Sharma, um, who went on to found his own company, A Forest, which um, ref reforests in India. Um, and he's got a really interesting TED talk on um, his journey to finding Miyawaki forest, so it's well worth a watch. Um, and Shubendu Sharma refined the tiny forest methodology, so kind of focusing specifically on their implementation in cities and increasing biodiversity and kind of making this process replicable as well. And so um, a few years later, um, the Miyawaki methodology and concept of tiny forests kind of reached Europe. So in the Netherlands, there's a Dutch organization called IVN and we actually partner with them. So the Netherlands is one of the most densely populated countries in the world. About 66% of their population lives in urban areas. And so um, IVM was really aware that thousands of children never visit nature and they never have the opportunity to. So the idea of having a miniature patch of wilderness and nature in the city was a really fantastic opportunity. And so um, this is where the Miyawaki method um, was kind of joined with engagement aspects and education and getting children involved in these forests, these tiny forests, um, encouraging them to plant the forests and then be able to watch them grow and develop and learning and interacting with them as they go. So this is kind of where we have the definition of um, a Miyawaki forest, which is the planting methodology becoming a tiny forest, which is including this engagement aspect as well. And so then finally, we get to Earthwatch and tiny forests in the UK. So back in um, the autumn of 2019, Earthwatch heard about the tiny forest concept and we got in touch with IVN. Since then, we've worked really closely with them. Um, they provided us with a lot of support um, and training. And so we're we are obviously learning and building on the knowledge and experience of those who've come before us. And so, um, 
Earthwatch is taking the tiny forest concept and in addition to the education and engagement side of things, um, we are monitoring all of our tiny forests. So we're collecting scientific data, as Meg already said, through citizen science um, to help us better understand the forests. Um, and this obviously provides additional learning and engagement opportunities for the local tiny forest communities as well. Um, so what actually is a tiny forest? Well, the aim is to have a fast growing, dense native woodland um, that's about 200 square meters. Um, so that's about the size of a tennis court. So it really, really is a small area. And that's why it's so um, one of the benefits of being able to try and uh, plant these in cities in particular. And the, this is combined with an engagement program um, to support the community ownership and provide social benefits. And so Tiny Forest is fast growing, um, has low mortality. We plant native trees, which are a mix of all the four forest layers um, and has low maintenance requirements. And so obviously like any trees, um, any urban trees, they hopefully provide lots of environmental benefits, so carbon capture and biodiversity enhancement, improving thermal comfort and flood management, um, but also being beneficial to human health and well-being and the social aspects as well. So pre providing a green space for urban residents and a place for education and time in nature as well. Thanks, Mike. So, um, as we've already said, we use the Miyawaki method to create a forest, which is fast growing. So we'll just briefly talk about how this works. So obviously in traditional forest succession theory, it takes several hundred years to reach a climax community following a disturbance. So you'd start with early successional species or pioneers, um, and these create a microclimate that then makes it suitable for later successional species and eventually climax species to grow. Um, and as they do this, they improve the soil conditions, um, allowing mycorrhizal communities develop and other underground biota to establish. And so this healthy soil supports these later species. So in the Miyawaki method in a tiny forest, we plant tree species that are more typical at the far end of the successional timeline with a few pioneers mixed in. And so we try and make um, this later forest community um, possible through our soil preparation, um, where we try and create the conditions for a healthy soil food web to establish. So um, we excavate the footprint of a tiny forest, and this is mostly to decompact the soil, which is often a really big problem in urban areas. And then we add in some soil supplements, which are chosen specifically for each tiny forest location based on the soil type and quality. And so the purpose of these is to improve the nutrient content and the water holding capacity of the soil as well. And hopefully all of this together can support the dense planting that we do in a tiny forest and kickstart the forest establishments. And then hopefully what we end up with is a really dense pa uh, patch of forest um, in the middle of an urban setting, um, which is really complex and heterogenic and its own little ecosystem. So as we've um, already touched on, each tiny forest will be monitored through citizen science. Um, so this means that the local communities or local schools will be part of the scientific data collection. Um, and this is to determine um, the potential of tiny forests as a nature-based intervention. Um, so we'll monitor the forest under four key themes, and these are carbon capture, flood management, thermal comforts, and biodiversity. And so because of the methodology that we use, um, we have some expectations of what we might see, but obviously the data collection that we do over the coming years will hopefully tell us more. So in terms of carbon capture, we expect to see an increased rate of carbon capture because of the accelerated growth rate of the forest. So we plant 600 trees in a 200 square meter patch. So that's um, a very high density planting as 
compared to traditional methods. So that's three per square meter. And so hopefully this accelerated growth rate um, means more um, carbon capture through more biomass production. Um, and so we'll monitor um, this element through taking tree height, um, tree diameter and tree mortality um, measurements. The second factor is flood management. So obviously a massively vital part of the forest is the soil that it's based on. Um, and so we'll look in detail at what the soil is doing. So trees um, play a role in the hydrological cycle and can provide flood management services, which is really imperative in urban um, centres where you've got a lot of impermeable surfaces. So their roots will help water penetrate into the soil at a faster rate and um, store water as well in the soil. You've also obviously got the canopy cover with leaves and branches, which can intercept the rainwater. So you're spreading the effect of a rain event over a longer period of time, which hopefully helps reduce um, risk of flooding. And so here we'll look at things like infiltration rates, soil moisture, soil compaction and soil texture, as well as soil colour. So getting, getting your hands dirty in the soil. Um, so that's a really fun part of the monitoring. We also have thermal comfort, so tiny forests have the potential to help regulate urban temperatures. So as Meg said previously, the urban heat island effect is um, a increasing problem in uh, urban centres. Um, and so obviously as trees take up water, this evapotranspirates out of um, their leaves and this um, means that the surrounding environment can be at a lower temperature so it's cooling the air around them. Obviously trees also provide shade and so this can improve the ambient temperature for humans. Um, so here we'll look at both the physical temperature recorded on um, weather stations but also asking people about their personal experience. So thermal comfort is also a lot about how people perceive their te the temperature and is it comfortable, are they too hot or too cold. And then the final one is biodiversity. So in the Netherlands, their forests are a bit older than ours and they have recorded over 500 species of uh, plants and animals in their tiny forests. So expect biodiversity to be enhanced in a tiny forest because we have created this complex ecosystem within an urban area. So creating lots of different niches um, for organisms. And also as part of the wider urban area, a tiny forest forest can serve as a stepping stone or as part of a corridor in the existing urban green space. And so we'll look in particular at um, biodiversity in three categories. So we'll look at butterflies, pollinators and ground dwellers as well. Great, so um, thank you Beth. Um, so there's a lot of environmental impacts that we're hoping to see and to monitor through the tiny forests, but um, arguably one of the most important things is the kind of social engagement opportunities that they provide um, from selecting the design of the forest um, with Beth. She's had a lot of experience with this over the winter with schools picking their designs um, to kind of um, choosing the locations, the tree species lists, um, kind of being part of the process all the way through to then planting and using it as a kind of learning space um, or just a, a, a green space to be in. Um, for many of the communities that we are working with, this is the first opportunity that they've ever had to plant a tree. Um, so it's quite an exciting experience, um, which is really great to see. Um, and because of the accelerated growth rate, they can see the difference of their kind of their efforts quite quickly. Um, we were actually just at one of our more local tiny forests um, on Wednesday, and we were all amazed at how um, kind of full and wonderful it's looking just um, 12 months after it was first planted. Um, so very exciting and to see colleagues in real life for the first time in about 15 months as well um, it was quite a strange experience um, so what we are 
just one more slide here then. So tiny forest so far, we've planted, I believe 16 um, through our first planting season, which runs October to March, um, all across the UK and one in Jersey. Um, and we have an ambition to plant 150 by 2023. So they'll be popping up all over the UK um, very quickly. I think we've got quite a mammoth task of a lot to plant next planting season, um, which is both wonderful and slightly worrying, but um, yeah, great opportunity. So hopefully if there's not one near you at the moment, there will be very soon. Um, at this point, if anyone has any specific questions for maybe Beth about the monitoring um, or, the, or the, the methodology, um, or we can swiftly move into the learning side of things. I've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, if you're happy, Megan, to go through yep. those now. Mm -hmm. So one of them's just come in from Ruth, which is about how do you go about choosing your sites? And is it possible to volunteer on any of the sites of you? Yeah, absolutely. So site selection is a bit of a, um, uh, sometimes a chicken and egg situation. So we sometimes have funders who want to work in specific areas or landowners who want to host a tiny forest. So it's a bit of a collaboration approach. Sometimes they're um, located within school grounds. Sometimes they're on public access land in kind of urban parks, um, cities. Um, but typically the council will be involved to kind of select the sites as well. Um, so they they become a resource for the community um, then. That's brilliant. And I, I've got I've got one question. So you're collecting lots of data um, and busy doing that, Beth. How's that going? I know it's your early days, but how's that citizen science going? Is data coming in and is the, is, is the engagement there? Um, so it's very early days in that our first <laughs> monitoring event officially is the beginning of June. Nice. Um, so obviously we want the forest to be kind of out in leaf and we'll monitor over um, the kind of summer period. So um, we did a pilot session last last year with our first tiny forest, which was really excellent. And um, I can't remember how many people we had to come but um, people getting really engaged and it's nice because there's a diversity of um, activities to do. Um, so as Megan was saying, we went to the forest on Wednesday and we trialed this on staff and everyone seemed to enjoy it. Um, but the plan is to have a data platform. Um, so a bit later in the summer, this should be ready. So if, um, where they're leading these um, monitoring sessions. Um, that'll be kind of face-to-face -face engagement, but then there'll be the opportunity for individuals to collect data by themselves and upload this through the data platform, which hopefully makes it really easy for people to do that. Um, each forest also has what we're calling a keeper team. So this is kind of a more engaged group of volunteers who kind of check in on the forest for us and um, do small bits of maintenance where needed. And the response from them has been really overwhelmingly positive. Um, so um, they're really keen um, to get involved with the data collection as well. We have some numbers associated with their tiny forest as well, which is great. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. And I suppose that goes back, sorry, to um, Reeve's question is about how do you get involved with the volunteering? Can does that come through you or does it go through each individual site? Yeah, so if you see there's one local to you, then it would be that you could get involved with that one. Um, the data platform should soon have a lovely map, so you'll be able to have a look where your local forest is. Um, but in the meantime, our contact details are at the end of this, if anyone would like to get involved. Um, we can maybe match you up with a local forest or one that might be coming to you um, in next planting season. Um, part of the reason for the delay at the moment is because of actually working with people um, has been obviously a challenge for all of us over the past few months. So um, yeah, we'll, um, we're looking start of June, that will be changing. So we're very excited. <laughs> 
Brilliant. That's the end of the questions at the moment, but obviously people can see, keep popping them in chat. So I'll hand back to you to continue with your presentation. Great, thank you. Um, so Beth's covered a little bit about the citizen science, but in terms of the resources that we have available, um, they'll be both on the digital platform, but there's also going to be printable versions or digital versions of all the instructions so that anybody can go and kind of self lead. Um, from an education perspective, we our kind of program is that we run an introductory webinar similar to this, but a bit more extended about tiny forests. We run an educator workshop um, in person, hopefully in the future. Um, again, so that's getting together any body who is an educator, teacher, teaching assistant, local volunteer, local to the tiny forest for a few hours in the evening to run them through all the monitoring um, protocols. Um, and then we run whole day workshops with either um, primary schools or secondary schools as well, where they get to have a go at getting hands on with all these kind of research projects. And then Beth and her team also run some really great community days with kind of local groups, local residents, um, youth groups, maybe special interest groups. Um, so anybody who wants to get involved with the forest. Um, okay. um, yeah, so just a bit more detail on the kind of things we are collecting um, with our monitoring program. So the idea is we have these four topics and each one um, is kind of set into modules. So you have a discrete module that is around 50 minutes um, and you can do that one activity and it's a standalone activity um, and then it's, it's done. So if you only have a short amount of time or you only have um, the length of time of a, a class, um, then you can, sort of pick and choose the bits that you want that are most interesting um, or if you have a full day you get a chance to have a go at all different kinds of monitoring so um, it's quite flexible in that regard. So when we're looking at carbon capture for example there's the opportunity to do a bit of tree species ID so looking at the trees um, trying to identify them based on their leaves and their branches and what have you and then obviously trying to get an estimate of uh, carbon capture by estimating the above ground biomass so to do that we need to take a measurement of tree height um, which is quite nice when the trees when the forests are still young you can get up close and personal with the trees and measure them with a tape measure um, and then I'll also um, alongside that tree diameter, so using equipment such as um, calipers, so a bit more technical, or if you don't have that, then you can also use tape measures or even a piece of string um, to measure the diameter. Also counting the stems on the trees and also looking for signs of mortality as well. Next one, please, Megan. Um, then looking at flood management, as I said before, this really um, concentrating on the soil. So there's some observational steps in this. So looking at um, what the moisture content is of the soil, thinking about whether it's saturated, is it really dry and parched and linking that with an infiltration test as well. So this is kind of a homemade version with a piece of piping and timing how long it takes for the water to soak into the soil. Um, again, looking at um, using bits of equipment like a penetrometer, um, which tests the compaction of the soil, and then some really simple, easy, getting your hands muddy um, ones. So classifying the soil's texture, where you're doing um, a texture by feel, little experiments, adding water to the soil in your hand and seeing whether it's sandy or clay or loby, um, and also classifying the soil colour as well using the little chart that's at the bottom there. Then thermal comfort, like we spoke about before, this is um, really influenced or a big part of this is your personal observations and your personal perceptions. So do you feel warm? Do you feel cold? Is that comfortable to you? Because every 
everybody is going to experience this differently. And so coupling that with actual readings of um, temperature and humidity and wind speed and seeing how those things align and making a comparison between inside the forest and outside the forest or even near buildings where we might expect it to be significantly warmer. And then of course biodiversity, which are always really fun. We're looking at butterflies. So actually on Wednesday when we were in the forest, um, we saw quite a few butterflies, which was lovely. Um, so part of that is doing a timed count. So considering the whole forest, what's flying around there, but also over the whole course of the day, if you see any butterflies in the forest, there's kind of a big checklist um, by the classroom area of the forest where you can mark down what butterflies you've seen. Um, we also have a pollinator count, which um, when we've um, done this pr last year with our Whitney Tiny Forest, everyone found it really meditative and really enjoyed sitting quietly for 10 minutes and watching your little patch and seeing what bees and other pollinators are visiting the trees, which is really lovely. And then Often people's favourite one is the ground dweller counts where we have some paving slabs in the forest and um, looking beneath these to see what kind of creepy crawlies, what earthworms and other soil fauna um, are living there, which is always good fun. So um, those are all the various activities um, that um, the students can get involved with. Um, we have, like I said, resources for to take you through all of this. Um, we have the teachers packs for Key Stage 1, 2, 3 and a Scottish curriculum, uh, well, Scottish schools version as well, um, with a primary and secondary introductory guide to monitoring. So that's all on our website, so we'll make sure you have the link to that. Um, because a lot of the activities um, could also be done in any piece of woodland. So Tiny Forest is obviously a great resource, but if you don't have one locally, you could very well do one in a children's, these projects in a children's forest. I'm sure the kids would essentially love to have a go at some of the science experiments, um, wherever they might be. Um, and yeah, there'll be ID guides and all the rest to go with it, um, fact files and bits like that. Um, on the monitoring day, um, the kids can, we would typically do an assembly in the morning. Um, it's going to be, we'll see if that's possible in post-COVID world in June. Um, but then we'll have the, the school children coming out through the day, um, having a go at different parts of the modules that Beth just talked through. They have a go at lots of different elements. Um, and of course they will have already been involved in planting the forest, which is what these students here are doing in the photographs. I think we were lucky with a lot of blue sky days and this past winter somehow planting, or we just selected some nice photos maybe. Um, but Beth mentioned a little bit of equipment, but what, how it's been designed is that um, the majority of the research can be done independently with little to no equipment, apart from maybe some instructions. Um, there are two, so that one that needs a weather station and one that needs a soil penetrometer, that um, it's, it's quite pricey equipment. So that might just be done when Earthwatch are on site or if the local community or council can fund some kit, but the majority of it can definitely be done um, independently, which is great. Um, we have loads of supporting resources as well, uh, looking at kind of outdoor learning, citizen science, um, the SDGs, um, community change makers, um, and it's all free. So you're very welcome to go and check it out and get involved with that. Um, I'm swiftly moving through because I'm aware that we're coming towards the end of our time. Um, but please do get in touch if you've got questions about any of this bit as well. Um, but Tiny forests aren't just about the citizen science, they're def definitely a space for learning. Um, each one, almost all of them have a classroom space, uh, which sounds very similar to the children's forest, having that focus area where you can bring the group together and spend time together as a group. 
Um, so the tiny forests have this with some benches um, or um, log circle kind of thing um, for them to sit in. Um, and really we're looking for it to kind of enhance traditional classroom based activities. So encouraging teachers to go beyond the classroom and teach their typical lessons outdoors. So maybe they could do some nature sums, um, gathering natural objects from the forest to do simple sums, tally charts, bar charts, um, learning kind of biology of how trees grow, um, putting seeds in CD cases to see the whole growing process, um, arts, maybe doing nature kind of scavenger hunts, um, creating mandalas, um, sensory walks or sound maps. Um, our favourite one personally is uh, sounds of nature, getting them to sit quietly. I think as a facilitator it has the same effect as sleeping lions, so you get a little bit of peace and quiet for maybe five to ten minutes, which is wonderful. Um, but they could also do other science projects, so maybe hypothesis testing, they could put some um, toilet roll bird feeders out with different um, materials on them or, or coatings to see which one attracts more birds um, and bits like this. So um, there's lots of opportunities and we're really about uh, working with the teachers first and getting them confident to see it as their resource that they can regularly use to take their kids out because we can go and visit which is wonderful but we're not going to be there all the time so we want the schools to feel like they are and the local um, educators as well maybe forest school leaders to feel like they can go and use it as and when they like because um, the positive impacts that it can have on the students from kind of well-being, risk awareness, communication skills, um, confidence and that kind of curiosity and respect for nature is something that we really want to um, kind of empower the teachers to kind of um, promote with their students and give them those opportunities. Um, one little bit extra is that we link all our work through to the sustainable development goals which you may or may not be familiar with um, but they were created in 2015 by the United Nations in an ambition to kind of bring uh, peace and prosperity to people and the planet. So there's 17 goals um, and they're all about different areas of kind of society and the planet um, that need improvements um, and there's a lot of environmental ones um, direct environmental ones so things like climate action or life on land but there's also ones around quality education which within there sits kind of goals around making sure that the next generation is well informed on sustainable sustainable kind of opportunities and uh, actions that need to be taken for a kind of um, a planet that we live in balance with um, and within our means for. So um, they have some incredible resources on their website um, in every language you can think of, of course, um, and lots of videos. So really great one to check out. Um, but it can be used within our, like your tiny forest. So again, good health and well-being, doing some mindfulness. I personally loved the children's forest visualization. Um, I got a little bit sleepy straight afterwards, I think, because I've got so relaxed, uh, which was wonderful. But this is something that could be done uh, listening to maybe bird sounds, um, quality education. Maybe they could be looking at kind of literacy projects, um, doing creative writing in the in the tiny forest. Um, again, I think I'm just going to be pinching all of Children's Forest ideas. I love the little um, pledges or wishes on the um, bark as well. So that kind of writing and the poetry. Um, there's lots more ideas there as well um, of linking through to um, the sustainable development goals. Um, and we find that they're a great space to communicate kind of sometimes the big issues, things like um, climate change, because 
um, even as adults, the concepts can become uh, very overwhelming and feel quite powerless about where on earth do I start? Um, what can I do? And giving the young people both something as an action in a nature-based solution um, that they can be a part of and see the effects of, um, but also just a space in an urban setting where they can go and spend time in the environment can kind of build the foundations where those discussions about difficult issues um, can be done in a more kind of positive um, positive way potentially um, and they can see see potential solutions and um, see how their creativity can be part of the solutions as well um, because what we as part of our community change makers work we then want the students to potentially get involved with um, speaking to their local councillors or communities and spreading the word getting more people involved um, using their kind of creative powers so social media and um, video making and arts and literacy so they can kind of become champions of both tiny forests and of um, their local environment as well um, so um, we always love to signpost to everyone else's wonderful work um, because I think half of you are probably on this um, call at the moment, but um, we try not to replicate um, what other people have already done. So if, um, if you've got any great resources that you think we should be sharing with our schools and communities that we work with for Tiny Forest, please do let us know, but we very much do send them all off in your directions to kind of get involved and learn more about um, not just tiny forests, but the big forests too, so that they can go and get involved. Um, so yeah, we will finish there. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen, but we'll make sure you're sent the slides afterwards. So you have our contact details um, as well. That's lovely. Thank you, Megan. That was really nice. Um, I've got a few questions and then I'll hand back to um, the other Sarah <laughs> um, that have come in. So one of them was um, about sort of going forward and do you support creating sort of sustainable forest management plans and the support after once it's all planted? Um, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, go on, Beth. <laughs> would you like me to sit there, Megan? Yeah, go on, Beth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so at the minute, not in a formalised way like that. So um, we firstly, I suppose I should say um, we we don't want to manage the forest. So going forwards, we will um, support the forest in the first few years, doing small amounts of maintenance to make sure the forest establishes well. But then the idea is that the forests are left as self-sustaining systems. So for example, we don't plan to thin any of the forests and any um, mortality that does occur, the trees will be left within the forest um, to kind of recycle and become part of the ecosystem. Um, but in terms of the first few years, we'll facilitate um, the keeper team. So this, this group of more engaged individuals. So we provide them with online training, what their responsibilities are as um, a volunteer, give them drop-in Q&A sessions, where if they're experiencing um, issues in their forest with things from, um, oh, we've got tree mortality, all the way through to um, antisocial behaviour and problems like that, we can try and assist and facilitate them. And we do this as kind of um, a community. So um, we had one a couple of weeks ago and keeper teams from all over the country joined us. And so there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning in that as well. So um, one tiny forest might have experienced problems that another tiny forest has, and they can share their experiences and advice for example, and um, to make that whole process a bit more streamlined, part of the data platform that we're building will have a, plat a place for those keeper teams um, to discuss those kind of things. But um, so we give them guidance on what needs to be done in the first few years in terms of um, small amounts of weeding and 
possible watering if um, it's absolutely necessary and a few other bits like that. That's lovely, thank you. And then the, the other question we've got is around, you were mentioning about sponsorship and funders and that side of things. So is there a general cost of how much it is to create a tiny forest? And is there any funding opportunities out there available to support say schools to do it? Yeah, so um, it's a bit of a matching exercise. So we sometimes have, uh, it's typically corporate sponsors or trusts and foundations that will fund a set of tiny forest and then we find the land to match up with it so what we've got on our website is a registration of interest form so if a school is thinking oh I'd love to host a tiny forest or the park down my road would be wonderful for it they can register their interest there and what when the funding is available it gets matched up um, councils can equally do it to say that they're interested or landowners as well so if you're interested in having one, you can register your interest. Um, people can self-fund them, um, but um, they are quite pricey, I believe. Um, <laughs> the costs have been reviewed recently, so I'm not sure specifically how much they are. But um, if you were interested in self-funding, we could get, um, get you in touch with our, our kind of development team for that part. Okay, great. Thank you. So one just questions has come in from Brenda. She says, um, is all this available in Northern Ireland, especially for schools? So you across the whole of the UK? We can potentially be, yes. It's, um, <laughs> we haven't got one yet, but we've gone as far as Jersey. So um, yeah, happy to plant anywhere. Um, we would just need to find the land and the funding for that area. I think me and Beth would love to go so <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely come forward <laughs> that's great okay lovely thank you very much I'm going to hand back to Sarah now for the last few minutes of the thing thank you very much oh thank you so much thanks Megan and Beth and and Sarah for fielding the questions there is so much in that that has uh given us masses to think about and as we come to this point in, in the global history of uh, climate change and biodiversity and COVID and the mental health and well-being of people, to hear these messages from you, I think has, has been hugely encouraging, just reading in the chat box um, comments that people have made. So at this point now, it, it sort of is, is over to me to invite you to stay in touch with the Forest Education Network England. Uh, this video will go live onto the um, website. Um, I keep calling it a website, it's a Facebook page. It'll be on there. The RFS, um, so the Royal Forestry Society, they host it for us, which is great. Um, many, many different organizations are part of the network. If your organization would like to sort of get linked in, please do get in touch with us. Uh, there will be real events happening in person and we intend to be in a woodland near you one day soon. So maybe we'll get to host a forest education network meeting in a tiny forest and in a children's forest. That would be really great in the next year or two. So thank you very much everyone for joining us. I'd like to also invite you to check out the Nature Premium campaign and see if you would like to sign the petition, if you would like to get involved, if you'd like to support the work that is asking uh, the government to make access to nature a key part of every child and young person's education. We are looking very much at involving the financial world, the um, econ so e e economy and finance. It's very much looking at the Dusgupta Review and how we know that if education is connecting children and young people to nature, that we will have a future generation who know about the sustainable development goals, they know about their responsibility, they feel connected, they have, um, they have the skills and the knowledge that they need and the passion that they need to make better decisions than previous generations have made. But being part of this network is a, is a valuable thing. So I would like to, on behalf of everybody, just thank you for joining us. And uh, I think we're looking at, we've got four, six minutes left. If there is anybody who would like to ask a question, 
make a comment. I haven't got my thing set properly so I can see you on. Let me just do that. Let me see. Is there anyone here who would like now to just, if you'd like to make a comment, wave your hand or pop something in the chat box. We've literally got five minutes left and I know that there are many knowledgeable people on the call. No more questions coming in, Sarah, but Brenda is uh, asking if we might do some live events in Northern Ireland, which sounds very tempting. It'd be quite nice. Wouldn't, it? <laughs> wouldn't that be exciting? I wonder if I can be cheeky and just come back to Pippa. Uh, and, and just Pippa, your, your feelings, having listened to Megan and Beth, are there things that you, I, I spotted in the chat box, you said it'd be great to get connected. <laughs> Yeah, Anna and I, Anna's just left, but we were sat here through Megan and Beth's talk, getting more and more excited about, you know, the possible collaborations and um, imagining um, children's tiny forests. So we're using the process of the children's forest to plant an urban tiny forest with schools was something that we were, we were dreaming into and also really, really loving and appreciating all your citizen science stuff and and that's something that we haven't developed yet but um you're right i think you said megan that the children would really love that and and uh, it seems so accessible i'm going to really ha have a really good look at your um your resources page and incorporate that into uh some of the kind of the tending stage of the children's forests and we'd love to have a zoom call as well with you at some point and see how we can work together so yeah great Brenda, you've, uh, thank you, Pippa. Brenda, you're waving your hand. What would you like to say? Um, in regards to the tiny forests, um, if you sign up for it and if you know the funding is, is acquired for a tiny forest, what level of the citizen science and the preparation has to be done by the school in order to secure that? Um, the difficulty being that schools, particularly in Northern Ireland, are very, very busy. And it's difficult to just get the hands on help, especially with the COVID regulations at the minute and volunteering. So I have been doing some of it, but it's been sheer hard graft with myself and the children. So just what's the level of commitment? Yeah, so um, it would depend. The, the tiny forest, there's a standard cost and that's like the community. And then there's an education package that's separate, which we all um, which is added on. And that would typically be the webinar and the staff training, um, in-person staff training for the teachers. But we do that as a twilight session so that it would just hopefully roll into when the school would typically run their uh, staff meeting. Um, and then um, typically it's, Beth, I believe, two monitoring events a year is, this, is the minimum. So that's two days a year of citizen science monitoring uh, that has to be done as part of the research. And then other than that, it's up to the school how much or little that they would like to go out. Of course, from our perspective, we'd love them to be out there all the time, but we are well aware the reality isn't sometimes like that. So um, yeah, um, just two days a year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're just about there. Um, we're, we're, we're delighted that you've been able to join us. Thank you so much. It's great, great to have Ruth on the call, who's popped the Nature Premium into the chat box for you to have a look at. And the other thing to be, I'm going to be cheeky with my Forest School Association hat on and share with you that at the beginning of October, the first weekend, is our conference, which anybody is invited to attend, Climate of Hope, Sustainable Forest School. And we will be welcoming friends from Earthwatch and the Children's Forest to the conference. And they're gonna have quite a key part to play in that conference. So if you, you've enjoyed listening to them now, uh, do consider joining us in Oxford at the beginning of October. So thank you everyone for joining us. We're delighted that you are here. There's so much work to be done and it's very exciting. I think that we are all connecting and sharing our skills and our knowledge and our passion. We know that this can improve outcomes for children, for future generations and for the planet. So what more exciting work could we be involved in? 